ado, um, welcome to the poster session on incentives and opioid use. And our first presenter is Dana Bourne. Uh, take it away. Can you all see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, so I'm Dana Bourne. I am the tobacco treatment specialist with the tobacco control program of the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and today I'm going to talk about implementation of quitline financial incentives to increase counseling sessions among specific populations in Vermont. So this kind of ties into Steve Higgins' uh, last presentation that he just gave about um, incentives on the quit line. Uh, previously, there were incentives for specialized protocols um, for pregnancy and postpartum Vermonters through our quit line vendor, and that was a $65 incentive. But in March of 2021, we actually were able to increase this incentive as well as um, implement two other incentive protocols to our quit line to better serve um, specific populations in Vermont. So the incentives that we were able to add were uh, for Medicaid and uninsured Vermonters who are about um, a quarter of our, of our quit line users and um, use tobacco at nearly three times the rate of privately insured Vermonters. So this is a population that um, has a high tobacco use rate and we really wanted to make sure we were giving the best chance to um, increase quitting. So that was one of the reasons they were selected. The other incentive group, group that was started was for menthol tobacco users. This was kind of with an eye on the Vermont state um, ban that is not in place, but is, you know, we're hopeful that that will come into place uh, in this next legislative session. Um, and then with the news of the federal ban, um, hoping to take place in the next couple of years, we wanted to um, help folks who use menthol um, to, you know, have the, the resources they need to help them quit. Um, finally, we were able to increase the pregnancy incentive from $65 to up to $250 for completing um, coaching sessions. So you can kind of see in table one, the breakdown of what these incentives look like. And our overall goal wasn't to drive traffic to the quit line, but rather drive callers from being a first time caller to completed their coaching sessions. We know it takes on average 11 quit attempts for folks to quit. And the more um, full coaching sessions you can have with NRT, the better. So we were hoping that by increasing incentives and kind of giving a reward at the end by completing that would kind of help that conversion rate from first time caller to completed caller. Um, the data that I'm representing is really brief. It is just a four month little window. So I'm hoping and you know, next year I'll have a lot more data to show, but basically we can see that through incentives, we're increasing the number of folks completing calls. And that's exactly what we wanted to see. Um, with our pregnancy protocol, there's, it's still, not, it's underutilized for sure. I think I didn't even calculate any um, any statistics. I think it was like a total of like two or th two or three people who actually received um, incentives. So it just wasn't enough to do any statistics on. But for our Medicaid and um, mental users, we've really seen a, a huge increase in folks getting this incentive and going from first time caller to fifth time caller, which is really um, the goal. Uh, I will lastly add that we, in the last month, have increased our menthol incentive to exactly match our Medicaid incentive to really further improve um, quit rates and that conversion rate. So if anyone has any questions for me, I'm happy to take those at this time. That's fantastic. Does anyone have any questions for Dana? Hey, Dana, really interesting data. So did you say that, what was it about the 11 phone calls? Or did um, so I there's that up? 11 was uh, 11 quit attempts is like what we see on average before someone can successfully quit. So the goal of our, of our quit line is really to just increase the quit attempts and the successful quit attempts. So having someone go through five coaching sessions and also receiving free NRT and an incentive kind of really we think will build that successful quit. So it's kind of all in, in combination. Um, for the pregnancy protocol, there are 10 calls, which um, Dr. Higgins kind of talked about in his presentation. Um, but yeah, that's where that 11 came from. Really just so this, stuff. oh, sorry. Um, so this, your outcome right now is looking at number of calls completed. Are you planning on um, doing further data collection with actual like quit attempts um, or other kinds of like behavioral outcomes? 
Yeah, so this data is all collected through our quit line. So it is a huge amount of data on one hand and then on others, it's like I it misses some pieces. So certainly in the next year, I'm hoping to look um, at more demographic questions as well. I think right now it, it's pretty broad just looking at Medicaid or uninsured. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested to see like who is more likely to utilize this and, and, and like that. And we can also look at factors such as how did you hear about this? Were you referred by a physician? Were you referred by, you know, someone else? So I think that this is like really interesting early data, but I, I agree that in the future, looking more in depth will be really interesting. Just from a clinical perspective, uh, to be involved in this program, I mean, really all somebody has to do is call. And then as part of that initial phone call, they would be identified as somebody who'd be eligible for the incentive program. Yeah, so this is for anyone who um, completes the first registration intake with our quit line. So that can be done online or by phone. Um, and then if someone chooses to have their counseling sessions, you know, online versus on their, um, like on a regular telephone, then that, that's fine. The incentives will still be selected. And they don't have to know about, you know, some states did like, oh, if you remember to tell us that you were sent by this ad that you saw, you'll get free incentive. We were just like, no, anyone who's Medicaid or uninsured, we're just going to give this incentive. Um, anyone for pregnancy, it is a special protocol. So they ask if they want to be in that protocol, but for everyone else, it's just sent. And um, yeah, we've only had one person go, why am I receiving money? What's happening? So everyone else is just, is very thankful, but, <laughs> but I've had a few people, you know, contact, but it seems to be going well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dana. I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next presentation and then um, it, we can come back for questions all around um, once we finish with everybody. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Sydney, uh, Dr. Batchelder here at uh, the University of Vermont, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Take it away. Sorry, <laughs> I was muted. Um, so uh, uh, thanks for uh, handing it over to me, Rhiannon. Um, I'm gonna be talking about smokers and non-smokers among opioid dependent treatment seekers uh, today. And I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, UVM. Um, alrighty. So as we know, um, the opioid epidemic is, uh, is continuing and increasing. Um, and this has been exacerbated by the rise of synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Um, and uh, opioid users are also uh, more likely to smoke than the general population. Um, about three quarters of opioid users smoke. Um, they also have a lower quit rate than the general population at barely um, 10%. Um, and, uh, in those uh, with opioid use uh, disorder, smoking status and severity has been related to uh, severity of anxiety, um, heroin use, um, and more severe pain. Um, in smokers without opioid use, smoking severity has been related to um, uh, several other demographic and psychological symptoms as well. Um, so the present uh, study aimed to compare opioid dependent smokers and non-smokers on measures of psychological well-being, demographics, and pain severity. And this, uh, it was hoped that we could expand the literature on smoking and opioid users um, to some of these other participant characteristics that haven't been studied um, in specifically opioid um, dependent smokers. So we had um, opioid dependent adults entering a randomized trial um, and we dichotomized them into um, smokers and non-smokers based on whether they smoked greater than one cigarette in the past 30 days. Um, and then we kind of examined their baseline characteristics as a function of smoking status. Um, we also ran some additional analyses on um, the subset of smokers to evaluate, to evaluate the effect of smoking severity itself. The measures that we are looking at um, include demographic um, variables, um, the brief symptom inventory, which is a, a rating of psychological symptoms on a scale from zero to four. Um, and this includes nine subscales and three global indices of psychopathology um, functioning. 
Um, we also looked at the brief pain um, inventory, which rates the uh, where participants rate their intensity of pain and the amount of pain relief they've um, experienced in the past 24 hours and whether they received narcotic treatment for pain. Um, some other psychiatric measures that we looked at were the Beck anxiety inventory and the Beck depression inventory. And this brings us to the results of um, the dichotomization of those smokers versus non-smokers. Um, so overall, um, for our smokers, the average uh, cigarettes per day that was smoked was just under 18 cigarettes per day. Um, there were no differences found in age, um, gender, employment, pain, or psychological symptoms. Um, but there was a significant difference on years of education achieved, with um, smokers achieving significantly fewer years of education than non-smokers. Um, similarly, smokers are also more likely than non-smokers to have ever used IV route for opioids in their life. So now, um, this is these analyses are uh, just within current smokers. So we wanted to kind of uh, further evaluate um, some uh, severity of smoking um, uh, among some of these other um, demographic characteristics. Um, and so we found that rural smokers um, smoke significantly more cigarettes per day than non-rural smokers. Um, and there were significant associations with all but one um, BSI, that uh, brief, brief symptom inventory um, subscales, and then all three of the global indices on that, on that measure. Um, and here are the uh, associations between cigarettes per day and the three global indices on the BSI. Um, as you can see, there were similar po positive associations across the three indices um, with um, symptom intensity on the right here in figure three. Um, uh, uh, the symptom intensity on the positive symptom distress being the most pronounced. Um, so the, the intensity is what's driving, what seems to be driving um, the, the severity of symptoms. Okay, so um, overall, cigarettes per day was associated with multiple psychiatric symptoms on the BSI. Um, in the present study, we expanded research on um, to opioid smokers uh, to include uh, virality, pain, and psychopathology. Um, and within this, we replicated um, findings uh, of uh, IV history and years of education um, as risk as potential risk factors. Um, and we also um, and we also um, expanded findings of rurality um, where the, they found that rurality is, is a risk factor in non-opioid users. We found that this generalized to opioid users as well. Um, and this uh, overall uh, suggests that there may be additive effects of these risk, risk factors. Um, and that is all that I have. Thanks. Thanks, Sydney. Um, we have time for one or two questions before we move on to the next presentation. Nice job, Sydney. Um, as you know, one of my interests is always the overlap of substance use disorders and mental health symptoms and diagnoses. What do you? I'll just ask you to spitball. What do you make of the association between cigarettes per day and the psych severity measures? Um, it's it's hard to tell at this point because it's just correlational. Um, so they, it's possible that those symptoms are, were you know present before um, they start smoking, before they had uh, opioid uh, use disorder, you know th those things. Um, but I do think that um, it speaks to the increased risk that all of these things have together and also um, that you might be able to identify you know more high risk smokers um, in opioid users based on their psychiatric symptoms or vice versa um, across basically all of those domains um, and i think there was a question in the chat um, about and so pain was not associated with cigarettes per day um, we d it was trending trending in that direction, but the sample size was really small for um, the people that said that they, they experienced um, significant pain. Um, so I think that's why that, that there was nothing that we found yet. Awesome. 
Well, thank you, Sydney. Um, I think we're going to move on now to uh, Rebecca Cole, also here at the Vermont Center on Behavior Health. Vermont, uh, Rebecca, take away. Just sharing my screen one second. All right, can everyone see it okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about cigarette smoking in individuals with concurrent post traumatic stress disorder and opioid use disorder. And like Rhiannon um, said, I am Rebecca and I am a research project assistant with Dr. Peck in the VCB age at the University of Vermont. So uh, what we know is that PTSD and opioid use disorder occur together um, at high rates. And furthermore, people with opioid use disorder smoke a large amount of cigarettes. There's a high percentage of people who smoke cigarettes who also have opioid use disorder, as well as a higher than average percentage of individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder who smoke cigarettes. So um, what we see furthermore is that smokers with trauma exposure smoke significantly more cigarettes per day than smokers who haven't been exposed to trauma. And a recent study, um, I was actually looking at this, and um, it was published in 2021, Boudin's, and they said that trauma type may be associated with smoking behaviors, especially for people who had experienced adult violence, um, physical violence. So what we wanted to do um, in a secondary analysis was examine the smoking prevalence and frequency in our sample. So our sample is individuals with concurrent PTSD and opioid use disorder to determine whether the number, number of cigarettes smoked varied by the type of trauma that they experienced in our sample. So we had 30 adults who recently completed an intake assessment for a randomized trial examining the efficacy of prolonged exposure therapy for treating PTSD in individuals with concurrent PTSD and OUD. And we had them complete um, a variety of assessments, including the demographic and drug history questionnaire, which assessed their um, cigarette smoking behaviors as well as um, their um, opioid use behaviors and a life events checklist, which uh, assessed what traumatic events they had experienced during their lifetime and a clinician administered PTSD scale for the DSM-5. So that assessed whether the participants had current PTSD or not. And um, what we did is we calculated the percent of participants who are current smokers, the number of cigarettes smoked per day, and then used that to do independent t-tests to examine whether the cigarettes per day differed by trauma type. And um, what we can see here is just a demographic table and um, characterizing our sample a little bit. Again, there was 30 participants, um, about, Three-fifths of them were female, it was predominantly white, and they had been using illicit opiates for a while, um, around 7.4 years. They were on buprenorphine or methadone medication. All of our participants were on either of those two medications, and um, about half um, on buprenorphine, half on methadone, and um, had been using um, those two medications been prescribed them for around four and a half years, and they had moderate to severe PTSD symptoms based on their score on the CAPS-5. Um, so what we saw from our results is that actually 73.3% of our sample were current smokers, um, which is a significant amount of people in the sample, and they averaged at about 15.3 cigarettes a day. And um, the most striking result here is that the average number of trauma types directly experienced by these participants was 11.4 out of the 17 um, that we were actually assessing. And orienting you to these two graphs here. So the graph on the left um, is trauma types experienced by participants. 
So on the x-axis, you can see the trauma types. There are in the lighter green smokers and uh, darker green non-smokers. And on the y-axis, you can see the number of participants reporting experiencing these various traumas. So um, on the x-axis, you can see those trauma types from the LEC5. And um, what you can see main takeaways from this is that um, the highest number of participants were reporting physical assault and sexual assault or uncomfortable sexual experiences. And um, on the graph on the right, you can see the cigarettes per day by trauma type. Um, and again, orienting you to the graph, trauma type is on the x-axis and the cigarettes per day is on the y-axis. And um, those who did not experience the event, um, their cigarettes per day are in the dark green and those who experienced it are in the light green. And what you can see here is there really isn't that huge of a difference um, in between um, the different groups. Um, but you can also just to point out um, for physical assault, we had every single person in our sample um, had experienced physical assault in their lifetime. So not there we go. Um, so just some conclusions from this. Um, the prevalence of smoking is notably higher in our sample than in previous studies of those with PTSD alone. However, the smoking in this sample is similar to the prevalence rates reported in studies of individuals with um, opioid use disorder alone. And um, in our current study, there was no significant association between trauma type and cigarettes per day which um, is different than what we were seeing in that 2021 Boudin's article. However, there are some major differences between the two samples. We have the PTSD OUD sample. And also, um, like I mentioned before, they saw an association between um, physical assault and cigarettes per day. However, every single one of our participants experienced physical assault. So we had a highly traumatized population. Um, whereas the Boudins um, were also assessing those who did not have PTSD versus those who had PTSD. So um, what I think is needed in future studies is a larger, more representative sample to determine if other PTSD characteristics may be more closely related to the smoking behaviors than trauma type in our sample. So in a highly traumatized sample with um, opioid use disorder, and um, they might examine the severity of avoidance, which is a PTSD symptom, as well as um, negative affect, which both have been associated with um, tobacco behaviors in the past um, for PTSD alone. Thank you so much for that presentation, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> Anyone have any questions for Rebecca at this time? I have a quick question, Rebecca. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Any yeah. chance, this is probably going down a rabbit hole, did you look at age of traumatic event and age of onset of tobacco use? Um, so what we did, because our sample, um, we have the ages of events that are recorded in our CAPS, sample, but we didn't use criterion A event for this because um, although all the people in our sample did have a um, one event that we went through on the CAPS-5, they actually, um, we thought that it would be a little bit more difficult to do the analysis considering the amount of events that each participant had experienced. So we didn't get the event um, age for all of the events that uh, our participants had experienced. So we only had that one event. Um, so we didn't actually use that specific event to go through our analysis. So we don't have that data necessarily for each event that people had experienced, um, but it is an interesting question. And um, we're now getting some data on childhood trauma and things like mm -hmm. that to see if there are, um, more associations on that end. Right. And what was that's the other exactly, that was it, really. That, and that's oh, exactly okay. what I was thinking. If it, mm -hmm. if there was some correlation seen with um, childhood, you know, and then a younger onset of um, tobacco use, or later, you know, if there was no trauma until let's say they were sixteen, and then 
and the onset of tobacco use was then maybe 17 or 18. But right, okay. right. Yeah. And we do have the data for the age of uh, tobacco use. However, mm -hmm. we don't have really anything to go by because we don't know necessarily when, you know, they may have first started experiencing these sure. traumatic events. So definitely yeah. something interesting that we want to use in the future um, based on our uh, childhood trauma questionnaire that we're now using in our study. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're going to now move over to our final uh, presenter of the day. Um, we have with us Dr. Bethany Yan from the Vermont Department of Health. I'm working on pulling up my presentation. Can you all see that? Great. So thanks. Um, as shared, I'm Bethany Yon. I work for the Vermont Department of Health. Um, I'm located in the Rutland Office of Local Health and work as a chronic disease prevention specialist. And I'm really happy to be able to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon, this evening, sharing our work, um, supporting pregnant and postpartum women with smoking cessation. So a little background to get started, um, Vermont smoking rate is more than twice the national rate. And while this little graph looking at smoking rates during pregnancy over, gives you a glimpse of that over the course of our project, you can see that Rutland County's rates, which is the blue line, um, is substantially higher than Vermont in orange when we started the project back in 2018. And certainly from Dr. Higgins' presentation this afternoon, which I was able to catch a piece of, we know that research-based cessation programs at UVM um, offering these much larger financial incentives um, yield much higher quit rates than tradi traditional cessation programs. And Dana gave you a glimpse of what the health department is trying to do to change up what's happening with incentives. Um, so we've added those and hoping that that's gonna continue knowing that there is some benefit there. But since Rutland County, which is located in the southern half of the state, um, it sits outside of UVM's catchment area for their studies, our team locally wanted to pilot a modified intervention housed with community partners to see if we could engage partners to recruit and counsel women within their clinical settings with better smoking cessation results than we've otherwise seen. So a feasibility study. Um, so to prepare our community, um, in 2017, we actually offered the five A's training, ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange, to our regional human services and health agency partners. And then we followed that up with Sophie's SCRIPT training. SCRIPT stands for Smoking Cessation and Reduction in Pregnancy Treatment. And we did that training with our one and only women's OBGYN practice in Rutland County to help support developing clinical workflow systems. And so then with support from Dr. Curdy, who was at UVM at the time, we modified UVM's protocol for use in two types of community settings, clinical and community health. Um, since we weren't able to offer any kind of home visiting options, we were going to need folks to come to us. And so from 2018 to 2020, pregnant women who smoked were recruited from the WIC program, as well as Rutland Women's Healthcare. Women were provided in-person counseling during scheduled meetings up to 36 sessions and received gift cards throughout pregnancy and three months postpartum contingent upon biochemically verified smoking abstinence. Abstinence monitoring began with really high frequency and then tapered through postpartum and our gift card values began at about $15 and increased to a maximum of 40. And so what did we find for results? Um, our partners were initially really concerned about managing large caseloads of enrolled participants. But over the two years out of approximately 256 births to Rutland County women who smoked, we enrolled 20 women. Um, and that turned out to be very doable. And we saw some improved quit rates. So we had some really lovely success there. Women who were enrolled earned up to $775 in gift cards, those quit, um, plus diapers and baby wipes over the course of the project. We had a number of challenges along the way. 
Um, certainly, while partners received tobacco treatment trainings and there were tobacco treatment specialists embedded within each program, WIC, as well as Rutland Women's Health, um, changes to clinical workflows and staff competence to engage women in meaningful conversations around smoking cessation turned out to be much harder than we expected. And so this graph looking at smoking cessation during pregnancy really illustrates a lot of the bumps that we experienced along the way with this project. Again, those blue dots are Rutland County. Um, you can see, you know, things did not go well at one point in 2019. That sort of aligns to when we had some losses of clinical champions. And so then we had a re-emphasis and success with renewed outreach efforts with print and community promotion. And then we had some subsequent challenges with the pandemic when we could no longer see people actually in person and we're doing some car side um, abstinence monitoring with a handful of women that we had re recruited at that time. So once we emerge from this pandemic, we really hope to take some of the lessons we learned working both within WIC and a clinical practice to see if we can't further adapt the program for clinical and community settings. So. Lots of bumps, but we're not discouraged. We're encouraged by the positive results that we experienced. So again, our partners were at the hospital, the WIC program, um, the tobacco program at Vermont Department of Health, the tobacco control program funded this and um, questions. So uh, I missed what you were saying about 250 pregnant women. Is that, was that correct? Over the course of the two years that we were recruiting for this project, when I look at, when we look at birth data um, mm -hmm. in Rutland County and look at the number of women who were smoking while pregnant in Rutland County and gave birth, that's approximately 256 women over the course of the project. Um, we recruited 20 of them. So that was our recruitment. So where, rate. where were they all? Where, where, where were all? They, they were not participating in a program. They either were reluctant, either maybe they enrolled in quit line, but it's, um, they weren't quitting smoking. So they were continuing to smoke during pregnant. They were being seen either in WIC or Rutland Women's Health. Some women in Rutland County go out of county for their health care during pregnancy. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. And again, for I think as we chatted with our partners, there was a lot of challenges in actually engaging meaningful conversation. It is normal workflow practice in both WIC as well as in the OBGYN practice to ask women if they smoke. So that question is happening, but the engagement with women to then talk a little bit more, just even using the five A's, which is really simple, simple counseling, um, it was, it was very hard. It, it just, didn't, it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. Seems like you could say, you know, we have this, this uh, cash program for you. We sure did <laughs> everywhere. And that's why, you know, we all thought uh, that we were just, our doors were going to be run down and how are we going to manage these caseloads? Because we knew that the rate of smoking in the county is so high amongst pregnant women. But um, we think that it really came down to that clinical community environment of actually engaging women in conversation. What we had heard when we had focus grouped with um, clinical providers before the project, they're worrying about about um, angering women and women won't return for prenatal care or they won't come back, that they'll lose trust. And thus we did this training work with practices to help them overcome that. But I think, you know, between staff turnovers, it's something that has to be an ongoing process. Great questions. And it's all the things we chatted about as well over the course of the two years. Yeah, it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard work. It's hard work. Hard work to get it to A, the confidence, hard work to incorporate into clinical workflows. They're so structured. Um, and even when we attempted to engage our um, visiting nurse folks, for them to have a longer conversation than just their basic in terms of what's their um, 
how, how are they reimbursed and compensated? So their minutes are very prescribed in terms of what they can do in maternal child health kinds of home visits. So um, it, yeah, it turned out to be much harder than we thought to take this UV, a research-based protocol and move it into community. So we're grateful for the successes that we had and look forward to, to, you know, again, making further tweaks. And we've done more training with practices in both Rutland and Bennington counties and, um, yeah, give it another go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Jan. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a really um, beautiful example of how difficult implementation is, even when you know that you have, you know, particularly effective uh, interventions. And I think you show that really nicely by talking about how that graph kind of correlated with like the loss of clinical champions and like how, how actually difficult it is to navigate a healthcare system like that. And I was very impressed to see um, how your uh, line bounced back uh, after uh, the pandemic and um, impressed to hear about how you guys managed to transition to do like roadside breath CO. So um, yeah, congratulations. There was, there was, yeah, thanks. There was a, it was a lot of um, IRB amendments over the course of the two years. And we navigated two IRBs, both our local hospital as well as the agency of human services. So we had a, a lot of paperwork involved to, to keep it going and make it happen. That is quite the logistical feat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we have a couple minutes left in this session. Does anyone have um, any other questions? I see that there's some discussion going on in the chat. Oh, Roxanne, I see you've unmuted. Yeah, I, I have a question for um, Bethany and Dana. I, um, I really great presentations, everyone. Um, I also work with pregnant women. And um, in my experience um, working with this population, I've, I've seen that they have a lot of other things going on. They often have opioid use disorder. They're often coming in and um, reporting IPV, intimate partner violence, and traumatic experiences. <laughs> um, so they just have a lot going on in their lives. And, and prior to actually coming to Vermont, I worked on a study in Michigan where I was traveling around the state and meeting both uh, uh, excuse me, patients and providers at substance use treatment centers and um, interviewing them about different healthcare services. And, and just anecdotally, um, my experience was that with the cigarette smoking and the cessation, it just didn't seem as much of a priority in the provider's perspective, just because these women, this population, they have um, these like immediate risks of the opioid use disorder, overdosing, addressing that, and then the traumatic stuff, the IPV, that's an immediate risk to their health. And the smoking was seen as more of a delayed harm for them. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering if it's similar here in Vermont, if that's been your experience, that that's another challenge for you with the providers is, are they seeing it as much of a priority as the other issues going on for them? Yes. So yes. So Dane is chiming in in the chat and I was about to concur exactly that, that yeah, we're definitely seeing some of that in Vermont as well. Um, and certainly the folks, our staff who were doing the counseling sessions with women really felt like they were spending a lot of that phone time. They said, I'm having to be a social worker. I'm not a social worker. Um, and really just providing a safe space to listen to women as they were processing all of the stress and trauma in their lives. Um, and to your point, yes, is which, what does a provider then want to address first? Um, and so different from a lot of the UVM protocols, they don't typically recruit in women who are dealing with opioids or who are in treatment, recognizing that that's a very, um, difficult demographic to support in smoking cessation. We knew that we were going to have a lot of co-users in our community, just knowing our community. So we decided to go ahead and recruit anyone who wanted to be a part of the project. And so if you take a peek at the poster at some point, if you haven't already, you'll see that five of our 20 women were actually using prescription medications and various drugs. And they were either on methadone or buprenorphine or reported that they had a history of cocaine and heroin. And we were actually really pleasantly surprised that a couple of those women quit smoking. So that was really exciting. Um, so yeah. But what you, what you outlined it, it, exactly. And, um, 
And so this trying to, you know, Dana's point, it is all reimbursable for providers to do this, finding the time for them, as well as, as to your point, prioritizing it. Um, so doing some of this training to really plunk smoking cessation conversations throughout a practice so that it doesn't just sit with the provider. And that's what the script training does. Um, it talks about, you know, anyone who speaks with a woman, if it's the medical assistant who takes the history, that that person is the one, begins the conversation and begins the five A's process and doesn't just rely on the actual provider, but that everyone in the office. And so working out those clinical workflows was that was still a challenge between lots of staff turnover and figuring out how to make that work. And early on, we were figuring out how to make that work. And then, you know, things got turned upside down, um, but it just sort of needs to be every Everyone is engaged in the process and not just a provider because yeah, providers don't have the bandwidth to do it all. Thank you for the, all of that. I think you, you hit on some, well, all the presentations hit on some important points today. One of which, one of the themes that I've heard today, there's an interesting discussion during the main session about like when you're doing research or clinical trials, like the difference between like aiming your research at like what is the best intervention versus finding ways to improve access. And it seems like particularly in some of these rural settings, like I'm thinking more and more particularly in our state of like, how can we improve access? We've got plenty of effective tools that we know that works. How do we get them into the hands of the people who need them the most? And particularly like working in rural counties, like, most of these providers need one more thing to do, like they need another hole in the head. Like, it's just like, we put all this primary care providers can do this, primary care providers can do that. And I guess thinking about those of us who work in well resource settings, finding ways to provide these services where it's not adding additional burden on, on clinicians and, and improving access to folks who can't make a long drive into UVM or who don't live in really close to campus. It is all that to say, it's really interesting to hear about these challenges in rural areas and just finding ways to improve access. I'm, I'm hearing those themes a lot today. And on that note, we are just about running out of time. Um, thank you so much everyone for engaging and for such a, a lively discussion. Um, really fantastic presentations, everybody. And um, have a good evening. Um, hope to see you tomorrow at the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.